Good morning. Welcome back to the Possum Creek Radio Show. Well, I think this is, uh, what, episode six? Six. We're doing pretty good here. Uh, I cannot believe how much rain we've had. My neighbor, who has a functional rain gauge, he says that we've gotten about 11.5 inches or more. My rain gauge goes up to about an inch and a half where it's got a crack in it and anything else runs out, which hasn't previously been a problem. Uh, so... It's been just raining and raining and raining. I got a lot of photos here for you to look at that I took this morning on the farm. It is amazing how fast it greens up around here. Everything was brown and dry. Well, you'd have thought that this whole world was dead. But uh, after about four days of good rain and soaking, everything's back green and just coming back up uh, lush and strong. The goat's loving it. She gets out to, to graze and uh, she just thinks that you know, green grass is much superior to the brown dried stuff, as do I. Uh, the pond is full to overflowing. I've never seen it at this level of capacity. Uh, even last year when it filled up, it did not get to this height. And, uh, well, that's just amazing to me. My gravity siphon system can work again when I need it. Uh, I don't need it right now. The ground is thoroughly soaked out in the garden. Uh, but, you know, it's nice that that's back and functional. The, I was sitting down by the pond last night, listening to all the frogs and critters and what go on and sing. And it occurs to me that our pond is no longer just a big hole in the ground. It is now a biosphere. Uh, it's its own little ecosystem, and I like that. There's lots of stuff going in it, growing in it, and it's just quite happy. Uh, the rain seemed to have come, and now we're getting out of them, which is, I guess, fine. It's got to dry up around here a little bit, or nothing will, we can't get nothing done. Uh, it's mud. Where our house and, and area is not really situated for heavy rains, and so there, there's just a lot of mud all over the place. You know, mud on the porch, mud in the house, mud on everybody's boots, mud outside, mud on the dog, mud on the chicken. Mud, mud, mud. I'd rather see it than what we were seeing, which was just everything dying. But uh, I don't know that for a once a year, it's about a once a year thing, and it lasts for about a week. So I don't know that enormous effort needs to be put towards to preventing that mud. So we had a, before the storm, we had a mama hen that she came out of the woods somewhere with three baby chicks. And that's always interesting. Uh, we... We've taken hens that have gone broody and let them hatch, and we've kept them in confinement. And you don't really end up with any better... When you do that, you don't have any better chicks than it seems like you did when you incubated them and put them in a confinement. So our goal is to put mama hens out there that will raise their own babies and do it effectively. I like that. I, I, it's part of that whole circle of life, and it's uh, the farm's renewing itself it's a, it's it brings it to more of a full functioning household but there are problems she came out of the woods the first day with uh, three babies and I thought well I'll catch her and put her in a chicken coop but she didn't want to be caught and she fled uh, back into the woods and today after all the rains and the storms and everything else she's out there with one baby now, I observed her some before uh, we tried to capture her. The uh, <clears throat> Some hens are uh, a five-baby, a five-chick hen. Some of them are a two-chick hen. Uh, she's apparently a one-chick hen. And they, just, they, can't, they can only count so high, and they can only take care of so many babies. And it just seems like anything over that number is going to die not going to make it and uh she went from three to one real quick i she would what she would do is she'd go over things that was too tall for the babies and she would just 
she'd wait on one of them, but as soon as one of them caught up to her, she was like, okay, that's my brood, and off she went, and she'd leave the other two stuck behind something until they either finally figured out how to get over it, or they just went around, or she came back by in that direction. So I think that's probably what happened. She she walked and walked and walked, and just moving over fallen logs or through bushes or dense grass or something, uh, she managed to abandon two of her babies out there. Which is a shame, but I don't know that I can do much about it unless I really want to go back to incubating all these babies. And I don't. What I, what I intend to get to is mother hens that can manage to effectively raise their own. And unless I let genetics take somewhat of a hand, I'm never going to get to that point. She's a, a little banny, banny hen, and those generally tend to do pretty good, but she ain't done good. Knife shop's doing well. Uh, I've got a whole bunch of custom orders that are pouring in, and I'm selling stuff real well. Um, it, it's just, it's been a good month, and it ain't over yet. I'm, I'm very pleased and encouraged. It's probably uh, fast approaching our highest revenue month, and I like that. I ordered some raw steel from uh, this one place up, I guess they're up north somewhere, but they can ship me raw steel of varying quality from, you know, really, really strong, brittle hard carbon down to the softer stuff to, you know, Damascene metal, um, stainless steel, of course. You know, they can cover a very wide range of products, and I'm very glad to have discovered this, this vendor. And I'm encouraged to start making more knives from scratch. Uh, one, it's more interesting to do it that way for me. Um, I, I also, I think I've lost some sales because some people just, they, they when they come to a custom knife shop, they want a handcrafted blade. They want it crafted all the way out from the steel process. And other people you know, are, are just happy to have a specific blade with a good handle and a good design. Um, but some people want it all the way from the beginning. I've, I've talked to some people, They when they buy a handcrafted item, they expect it to be, they expected that I went out and mined the iron ore, smelted it, made steel, came back, hand forged it, and then produced them a knife. And, oh, that's, that knife needs to cost $50. <laughs> so it's just not, not economically feasible. So, uh, in any sort of craftsmanship like this, some division of labor has to be made, but it is an economic principle that the less division of labor is done, the more labor I have to do, and the more dollars that are in my pocket. Because that's what you're effectively paying me for when I make you a knife. You're paying for my labor. The material cost is very low, unless you're using something exotic like a Damascene steel and the horn of a left-handed unicorn, but it, uh, the, the raw knife making is more interesting to me, I think it'll be more lucrative, um, plus this puts me in the goal of, uh, further, further toward the goal of being able to craft whatever I want, basically if I can see it in a picture, or you can draw it on a piece of paper, or I can imagine it, I can do it, and I'm very pleased with that, uh, that is kind of where I've wanted to get to for a long time. And I've worked with uh, various types of steels before and had good results. And so I'm very excited to get some of these really good specialty steels that should be arriving this week. Things are good. Things are real good here. I, you're going to notice here in a minute I've changed the format of some segments of the show. I'm not going to do it for every segment. But for some of the show, it'll be a sort of a video thing. And some of it will be the more radio, audio, picture format that you're more familiar with. Anyway, we're just going to mix and match as the whim takes us. I am nothing if not whimsical. So anyway, let's get on with the show. i got two segments for you today. Uh, it's going to be a little shorter show than it has been. But there's plenty to do around here now that the rain's broke, so i got to get to it. Y'all take care, and God bless. While we have a little bit of time, I want to talk to you about farm security. 
Now, a lot of you may think, <laughs> I live out in the sticks, so why do I got to be concerned with farm security? Ain't nobody out here. Um, y yes, no. Now, we don't have the problems that people in the city got. Uh, we don't really have a lot of hoodlums running around and that random opportunistic crime doesn't happen out here. Uh, and this really don't look like, you know, our homestead, it don't really look like some place you want to come creeping around to steal. But nevertheless, we've had a couple little minor incidents. Not with people actually stealing. Uh, it hadn't gotten that far. But we've had strangers drive up in the middle of the night. In the year and a half, I'm, you know, getting year and three quarters now, I guess. Uh, we've had two times that I know of that a car pulled up in our driveway and stopped in front of the house and then hurried off. Both times, I believe, they hurried off because they saw me approaching with a shotgun. That will tend to make people hurry off. The, the security aspect I want to talk about is uh, homes in the country, they generally determine thieves, thieves that really are doing it for a living. It ain't a hobby. It ain't just random. They know that a farm has tools, tools that you can sell at a pawn shop. Uh, you might have scrap metal laying around. Uh, you might have, you know, guns. Uh, guns are definitely in rural America a big seller, and pawn shops will take them. The there's a lot of stuff on a homestead that people can steal. The trick is getting in and getting out with them. And generally, they're going to try to break in and steal stuff when you ain't around because they don't want to get shot. Nobody wants to get shot. Burglars, least of all. And uh, around here, they can get shot. The They show up at night. That's just a scary thing because they know somebody's at home. They know somebody's got to be there. That ain't, that ain't right or proper. So... Let's talk next about the, the two primary weapons I feel every homestead should be equipped for. Alright, let's talk a little bit of history first. If you've studied the Rhodesian War, a uh, country that used to be known as Rhodesia, it's now known as Zimbabwe, um, you know that the, the farmers and the isolated homesteads they were targeted first. They were they were the government's first victims. Uh, criminals, rebels, whatever. They know that out on these farms are isolated people. And it hard, sometimes at night, it hardly ever seems like anything could happen out here. It's just so still and quiet. But if something does happen, the police ain't getting here very fast. And they don't really care. If there's something happening here and the city, they may not show up here at all. So we have to be prepared to take care of ourselves. After all, isn't that one of the reasons that you want to homestead? That you want to take care of yourself? You want to take responsibility for your own food. You want to take responsibility for your own water, your own education, your children's education, children's upbringing. By homesteading, you're taking all these different elements out of control of society and bringing them back to you, the individual. You're bringing the power and the liberty to that individual. Security just has to be part of it. Now, I know a lot of homesteaders that say, I don't need all that. I got me a big dog. All right, awesome. Uh, I, I'm not pitting the biggest dog in the world up against a man with a shotgun. I'm not going to do it. So, we stay armed. It's just a necessity. For almost everything, I prefer a rifle. If a predator is chasing the chickens, I go for a rifle. If uh, I hear a strange noise uh, at night outside, I go for the rifle. The rifle is my weapon of choice. Uh, I have a 30-30 lever action, several of them. Um, it's because we have multiple shooters in this house, and we converted to cowboy logistics a while back, which means that you just pile out a pile of ammo on the table, and everybody can grab what they need out of that. The 
the rifle I can reach out and touch somebody. I'm not a great shot, not among the best, but I can hit a target, man-sized target, 200, 300 yards. I've hit deer that far, man's not that much different. So um, the rifle is my go-to gun. Uh, I've got also shotguns in case somehow they manage to get right up to the porch and they're coming in the house. Uh, I don't want to be fiddling around with, with a rifle at that point. I can just pull the shotgun down off the wall, uh, point in the general vicinity, and put some buckshot into somebody. Those are your two main guns. I know a lot of people like their pistols. And I, there's a fella uh, used to be alive, Jeff Cooper, Colonel Jeff Cooper. And Colonel Jeff Cooper pretty much wrote the book on self-defense. And his take was the same as mine in that a pistol is pretty much only good in fighting your way to your rifle. For most farm defensive situations, I'm not going to go for a pistol. The pistol is fine for putting around town if somebody tries to stab you at the convenience store. It is not fine for dealing with hardly any situations that might arise on the farm. The rifle is more of a soldier's weapon, a farmer's weapon, a cowboy weapon. It is designed for exactly the way we live. And it kept Homestead safe for 150 years. If it did it for that long, I think it can do it for us now, today. been a week. I hope y'all have enjoyed as much as I have. Episode 6 is in the can. Covered a lot fewer topics today than I have in the past, but because of the rain, I'm stacked up on my work. The garden needs some tending. I've got a bunch of custom orders to fulfill, and my shop's getting deplenished or replenished a little bit this week. So, I got a lot to do this weekend and into next week. I hope that this past week has been as blessed for y'all as it has been for us. The pond's filling up. Bank account's filling up. It's been a good one. It's been a good one. So, I want y'all to have a good one. God bless. And y'all keep on being y'all. Thanks for the support. Back to work.